Hi, welcome back to the State of the Nation. I'm your host, host Mike Sham, and today we are joined by Sandile Swana. Sandile is an ex-lecturer at the Wits Business School. He's an ICT entrepreneur. Uh, he's involved in African media online, and he's a regular commentator on uh, some of the SABC political uh, broadcasts. I certainly saw some wonderful analysis when... Uh, we were treated to our almost cabinet reshuffle uh, when Soro Ramaphosa kept us waiting for days on end and then hours on end and then minutes on end before he told us he was going to have a smaller cabinet and he was going to do that by enlarging the cabinet. And he was going to reshuffle the cabinet by getting rid of nobody who was doing a bad job but just shuffled a bit of the deadwood and brought some people in there. And we got a minister of electricity even though we've got to other ministers that manage electricity. Here to make some sense of where South Africa is and what the plan is, is Sandile Swana. Sandile, welcome to the State of the Nation. It's lovely to have you. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, and uh, good morning again to your viewers. Yeah, now let's let's start off with, uh, let's call it the cabinet reshuffle. Right, that was uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and in essence, everybody who is doing a bad job in those important positions was retained. And uh, we got ourselves another minister of electricity because apparently a third minister won't do what the first two were meant to do. What did you make of it? Uh, the, the cabinet reshuffle, uh, uh, I, I would like to look at it like we normally do in a game of cards. In a game of cards, when it's time to reshuffle the cards, you don't get a new packet of cards. You take the same card, the same uh, cards, you order, reorder the sequence, and then you put them on the table, and the game continues. So we anticipated a lot of us that, in actual fact, Cyril was going to do exactly that. Um, and there are reasons for that. Two, however, what was needed uh, for the country as a whole and for an ANC that would have wanted to do better was to do something that has not been done since the Pulukwane Conference of 2007 of the ANC, which is to put the A team of a cabinet, A plus in fact, into position to take the country forward and to regain lost credibility and legitimacy of the ANC. Sorry, if we can just go back, you say that that was done in 2007? Wasn't the opposite done in 2007? where they took the A team out to put in the D team? It, that is exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. What I'm saying since 2007, yeah. so I'm saying before 2007, in fact, maybe if I must yeah. need to state it like that, okay. uh, you would see that there was always an effort to put in the A team. Yes. Uh, okay, and to be you. quite clear, uh, that issue uh, was one, a pressure to say all the promises that uh, the ANC had been fighting for since 1912. Uh, needed to be realized. Number two, this was one of the countries in Africa and in the third world more generally where the liberation movement had to prove that they can take an African country as a liberation movement and actually not make a mess of it because a lot of the countries that got independence in Africa have become total 100% disasters from 1960 until today. So the need to put an A team in position has been there from 1994, but that decision was actually reversed uh, in 2007. And a, a new type of cabinet was introduced based on criminality. So criminals were introduced into the cabinet, outright criminals, starting with Jacob Zuma and those who assisted him to fight against the state including the closure of the Scorpions, which was the prime instrument of the state to fight corruption, and which was arresting mainly ANC members who were involved in corruption, because those were the people who were holding the state purse and power and consuming illegally state monies. So that is what happened there. Then the other quality that was introduced in 2007 was the quality of incompetence. So people with no track record of achievement in life generally, 
in their careers and professions were freely introduced into the cabinet. And that pattern has been maintained from 2007 until today. And lastly then, um, uh, it was the culture of non-performance because you can be competent, but you are a non-performer, right? So the spirit and energy and motivation to actually get the job done at all costs, that spirit was lost in 2007 in the ANC. And let me then also say that relative to the cabinet reshuffle, that when you look at the published scorecards of performance of the cabinet of Sir Ramaphosa, Sir Ramaphosa and his deputy president, Didi Mabuza, they had been scoring around 40% of achievement themselves, which means actually if it was based on performance, the first two members to be reshuffled would have been Didi Mabuza and the president, which would then mean that actually you need to reshuffle 100% of the cabinet. So the people who would have gotten uh, at least above 50% in that cabinet from the various scorecards would have been about three members of the cabinet. Not to say these are people who achieved 80%, 90%, no, above 50%, generally speaking. So you are talking about a culture of non-performance. And the last thing I'll say about this is that in my judgment, since the departure of Tabombeki from the cabinet and from the presidency, the position of state president in South Africa has remained vacant because the people who have occupied that position, being Sir Ramaphosa, uh, also part-time uh, for a short period of time, Khadima Muntlante, and uh, Zuma, Jacob Zuma himself, those three, those three people do not have the minimum aptitude the minimum ability built in themselves uh, to be a state president of, of the Republic of South Africa. Maybe a village chief or some other little activity like that, but certainly not the state president of the Republic of South Africa. Certainly chairman of Sanko in KZN seems to be quite appropriate for Jacob Zuma. That may be some, a role that he can, uh, that he can play because uh, you know, he just obviously just doesn't want to retire to his, uh, his palatial home in, uh, in KZN. Well, it's not so much that Zuma may not want to retire. All of us, uh, we are not young men, you and I. Uh, we know that as time progresses, your levels of energy and the amount of stress that you want to take reduces. Hmm. Uh, so I'm sure Zuma would have loved to be looking after his cattle and, and, and his grandchildren and other things like that. But he has got to have some form of power, whether that power is civic power or proper state power. And that power is going to be used by him to prevent him from going to jail. Anything that is of a political nature that Zuma is doing is not that he's trying to help you and me or to help anybody. It is to save himself from going to jail. So in other words, it's to have a constituency of any source, any kind, so that constituency can fight. And as we saw in July 2021, you can at least mobilize a constituency so uh, his former comrades decide uh, to lay off him because it's just too troublesome to, to go after him. But let's look at what you're saying uh, when you're saying that uh, post Tabo Mbeki, None of the occupants of the union buildings has kind of been up to the task, and the results are, are, are almost uh, impossible to challenge because, my word, South Africa has never been in worse shape um, in post-democracies, uh, post-1994 South Africa. So if we look at the bench, you know, we, we get very concerned about Bafana Bafana not being able to qualify for anything, but it's, it's not for lack of uh, using the available talent. There just seemingly is no talent. Is there anybody in the ANC that you would employ in your business? Uh, in other words, yeah. is there anybody who could rise into those senior positions? Yes. Uh, yes. Because it's not, not evident to me that there's anybody there in the upper echelons or in anywhere in, yeah. in leadership. It looks like they could be a wonderful state president yeah. In the future. Let us let us then uh, let me then answer your question narrowly relative to the ANC first. But mm. I think the question is bigger than that. Okay. Uh, for instance, I think that if you look at the credentials of Pumzile Mlambonyoka, who, by the way, has been recruited, 
repeatedly by the United Nations to come and complete their projects at the very highest level, and she's done that with great success. And she was the deputy president at some point here in South Africa. Pumzilem Lambonyuka, to my mind, meet the minimum criteria, criteria, criteria to be a state president here, or a person of similar capabilities, background and experience, and a track record of success. And she was fortunate enough to have been part of a successful uh, cabinet uh, before uh, uh, the, the Pulukwane debacle but, happened. But her own track record was, was poor as a, as a cabinet minister. Uh, I, I don't know about that. The, let us say this. Let us say this. The, the, when you say the cap, there are other issues mm. that we need to look at. There are issues where, for instance, people would have argued with Pumzile Mlambo Nuga about the mining charter, about the BE aspects of, 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 the, of what she did in the mining industry. And I was actually in the mining industry, and I'm still in the mining industry. Uh, we made money. There, it was possible to make money under Mlambo Nuga. Mines made money, uh, and they were performing. But there were issues of a social and political issue that don't affect just mining, that affect South Africa as a whole. So, so to me, let's leave those issues alone. Let, let me then continue with my track record because my, my issue is about the people of the ANC. The second point I want to make is in order to win the liberation struggle, the ANC was one organization among many. In other words, there was what was called the mass democratic movement. So there are people who would have been regarded as as ANC members even, and the ANC supporters, who were never actually card-carrying members of the ANC itself proper as a narrow organization. In that group of people, those are the people who sustained the struggle uh, and successfully prosecuted the struggle. And there are actually a lot of people in that broad group who are very competent and who occupy many senior positions in South Africa, whether they are in boards of directors, whether they are principals of universities, Etc. cetera, chairmen of, of boards of companies, they, they are all over uh, 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 in that. And, and thirdly, those people, high caliber people, have been intentional, and it is commonly agreed, that anybody who was suspected of being competent, bright, uh, capable, or anything like that, was eliminated in the ANC. Uh, it was not a question of just saying you are eliminated whites, colors, and Indians. The clever blacks, so-called clever blacks, were actually eliminated out of the agency. And those who were dull, who, had, who were criminally inclined, who were incompetent, who were non-performers, then gained more and more power and entrenched themselves through assassinations. Uh, there are assassinations, by the way, in the agency for positions and many other strategies of neutralizing uh, people. Uh, in the ANC. Then the last thing I want to say when I said your question is actually much broader. When a nation is in the type of crisis that we are in, there are a few things that we need to do. One of them is that the parliament is made up of 400 members, not the 230 that belongs to the ANC. And the president is supposed to choose members from a cabinet from parliament, not from members of the ANC. So anybody who's capable, for instance, of being the minister of finance or the minister of mines or the minister of trade and industry, regardless of which party they belong to, if they are the most competent member of parliament, they are the ones who should have been put in, in, in the cabinet reshuffle to rescue the country from crisis, which is in a deep crisis. Then there's an outer ring the bigger ring, out of the 400. You have guys who've run the largest corporations in South Africa, who have retired, some of them recently, competent, exceptionally competent guys. We have some of the most senior engineers who are not members of the ANC, who can turn ESCOM around. Uh, and so in South African society as a whole, there are many competent people that there is no law that prevents any president who wants to be successful from recruiting those people and putting them into exact positions of power to turn the country around. So we must not uh, uh, beat ourselves up 
uh, because you and I have got no duty sitting in this studio if all South Africans are incompetent. I'm not incompetent myself, for instance. I, I won't group myself there. So, but I'm not in, in the cabinet, unfortunately, not that I'm aspiring to. So there are many people who are 10 times brighter than me, 10 times more competent than me, who will, ne will die never having been a cabinet minister, although they deserve to be there. But they are there. Okay, so you're raising two issues that, uh, that, that I feel uh, you know, are very, very uh, important issues. Um, issue one is fairly easy to, to answer, and I think I have a good idea where you would go with this. And that is, um, do you feel that the country has been, has been let down by those senior people that were edged out in the Zuma days? Even, to be fair, Tabo and Becky wasn't exactly embracing every clever person. He was also a collector of sycophants. He was also sidelining uh, some very competent people, you know, short man syndrome and all of that. You know, we know uh, he's modus operandi. He started this game, let's be fair. Um, where are those voices? Those voices seem to be reactionary. You know, we had Barney Petiana raise his voice only after Jacob Zuma had nearly completed his destruction. Only then did somebody like Barney Petiana find his voice. You know, somebody, uh, many of those people, where are those people, or are they now too past their prime and made too much money out of sweetheart deals to worry about the country? Yes, uh, the people who were activists, uh, for instance, Bani Pichana stood shoulder to shoulder yeah. with Steve Biko. Yes. Uh, that generation, Sats Cooper, and so yes. on, those guys. Those guys are finished. Those are that is a spent force, and it's not their problem. Okay. Right? The, 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 the people who, because there were different leaderships that happened in the period, there are people who led the university student revolt. Steve Biko was one of the leaders there. Then there are those who led the school revolt, uh, our generation in 1976, uh, and the and, and, and so on. So uh, what, then, what then has happened? Those guys were young. These are 20 year olds uh, before 30 years old. That was the age group that was mm. there. People still become 30 year old and 20 year old today. Mm. And, and they are sleeping on the job. Our children are sleeping on the job. The older guys, are more concerned with self-preservation about buying the next farm, about buying the next uh, special house in Pal or in French Hook and another one in Zimbali, trying to not to disturb the apple cut too much. He makes a controversial speech before too long, and I'm, I know what I'm talking about. I've received some of these calls myself, uh, whereby you make some speech that could be, could be rattling the apple cut, and then you get a call that, you know, Sandile, the things you are saying are so constructive and that, in fact, we think we can use you. In other words, you are being offered a job somewhere in the state. And then your mouth is going to be full of what you are eating there. Then you are going to say less. So money, a lot of these guys are very rich. Mm -hmm. A lot of the guys were activists. So they are impotent. They are totally useless right yes. now. And those who are not rich are so poor that they are economically and financially paralyzed and they no longer have their own infrastructure to stand up as independent voices. So we need new Steve Bickles to yes. rise up. And of course, much of their, uh, their future um, income depends on not upsetting that apple cart. Am I right? So why that would is, you do it? That is, that is absolutely correct. Uh, I mean, look, if you've got a jacuzzi, you've got all these types of things, the saunas and what have you, why, why do you want to create chaos? Yeah. Right? Well, you would do it only if you felt that the country that you have fought for is, uh, is potentially being destroyed for your grandchildren. You know, they say, well, you know, true uh, sort of selflessness is to plant a tree under which you would never sit in shade. You know, that, that's real sort of uh, patriotism, I suppose, building a country not for yourself, but for your grandchildren. I want to ask you something. I recently interviewed Kaya Satole, a guy I really rate highly, very intellectual. I put a question to him because I think he finds himself in that cohort of people that you're doing. And um, I said, what in, you know, during the Trump era, you know, Trump from a, from a communications perspective was brilliant. And what he really did really well was he created these cutting 
brilliant slurs that seem to destroy careers. You know, he would call uh, um, Ted Cruz lying Ted and, you know, crooked Hillary. And these things really, really stung to the point that those people were almost damaged goods by the time, by time he, he, he sort of finished with those insults. Well, South Africa has had an absolutely brilliant, brilliant insult. And it seems to have worked, but not on one person, on an entire generation. And that is when Jacob Zuma said, called out clever blacks, it seemed at that point that all young professional black people retreated completely out of the picture. I do not see 35 to 45 year old blacks making an impression anywhere. Yes, there, there is a, a, a damage that has been done. Jacob Zuma can be blamed for it, but I don't think that his impact is as big as... I'm saying his slur. Yeah, 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 I'm talking the, about the slur, but obviously it's like uh, Marx, Marx and Marxism go together. Mm -hmm. so, so let's say Zumaism, let's call it Zumaism, this clever black idea for the sake of argument. Uh, uh, I look at my own children, I look at my nephews, uh, nieces, and my younger cousins. Uh, I look at their level of political consciousness. They are nowhere near our level. The things they know and the things they are prepared to do about politics are very different. So the kind of discussions that have been going on in our homes, uh, and I'll talk about uh, black homes in general uh, 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 for that matter, I think the quality of engagement changed a lot to very basic things. Uh, that this type of discussion is about going to St. Stithians, going to Michael House, uh, uh, you know, how is the BMW X5 uh, or whatever it is better than the GLE of the Mercedes. The, the, the quality, and sometimes you meet adults, and, and you listen to, to the discussion, it's about the latest whiskeys and all that. Uh, so the commitment to nation building among the adults and their children in these homes, a person says, you know, as long as I can put my children in the private school uh, and get them to go to America for university or the UK and so on, uh, our people have been intellectually emptied and I'm not saying they've been in intellectually emptied by Jacob Zuma or by the white population or anything. They themselves, because I don't think my father needed anybody to be busy with him in order to educate us in the manner that he did. Or my grandfather. There are things that my grandfather told me about the struggle, right, that I still hold, that I believe I must be on mission about till today. Um, so when I look at my own children and the spirit of cowardice uh, that is in my own children, I, I get very worried. So let's talk about what's uh, causing that damage. And uh, yeah, we are, we're going to go into uh, Dr. Phil mode over here. Um, do you, how much, uh, it seems to me that there's, you know, I, I've been fortunate to speak to a lot of people that are hopefully going to play a role in the future of South Africa, but I'm concerned. You know, I've had Musi Maimani here, Songhezo Zibi here, uh, and, and there's a common seemingly offside line, a line that no, you're a bit like watching when you watch rugby these days, you're not 100% sure what the rule is, and I've been a lifelong rugby fan because it seems to change all the time and it's open to interpretation. Where should, in your opinion, should the country stand on the question of BEE? Because this seems to be the critical point, that this is, this is the, the, the current, we can talk about the original sin, but we're talking about the current one that seems to be blowing everybody apart, right? Yeah, so the policy of the ANC, we understand, is BE. The policy of the EFF is total dispossession and chasing out of, of the whites. We get that. The policy of the DA is kumbaya and everybody is equal. Some, you know, then you've got Herman Mashaba, who's having a problem within his own party. He is firmly against BE, but it seems like everybody else isn't right, within his party. These new parties come along, and I've sat here, and Herman and, uh, not Herman, Musi and Songhezo sat in that seat. And they seem to espouse a, a view of, we need it, uh, but we must just do it nicer, right? 
But you can't have, there's an offside line or there isn't. Where should we be with BEE in this country? Because it's the issue that's tearing, that tears our politics apart. I, I, think, I, I, I think the, even the question itself, I think the question exaggerates the issue greatly and, and misunderstands the issue. A, a few guys have gone up to, 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 to uh, Nobel Prize uh, status, economists this time, the Piketty's of this world, the guys who've written profound books and papers on inequality, mm -hmm. right, uh, the, uh, and how to correct inequality. Piketty in France is one of them, uh, one of the authors, and you have got some Americans as well in this field. Now, uh, so the, the title of BEE uh, 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 is, is, is what South Africans chose to call inequality or the correction of inequality. Others chose to call it apartheid because the idea of inequality in South Africa has been there for centuries, that people in South Africa, by law, must be unequal. And then the idea of equality of citizens is still struggling to actually emerge. So the, the theories that need to be adopted and philosophies that need to be, they are there. Piketty has written them out uh, to say that create a society which is more equal. Now, in a society that is more equal, the, the, you know, for instance, there are people I was born with in Soweto who can never dream to be in this studio, right? But because of my background, my educational background, my parents were educated, my father was an MBA from Vita, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I am here today. But there are people who are my neighbors, same circumstances, but we will never be here. They can't dream of it. So you do need, in order to create a, 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 a democracy, first of all, and a republic, you do need to have policies of equality. Now. Sorry, can I, inter can yeah. I to, to interrupt? Are we talking equality of opportunity or equality of outcomes? Because uh, that's obviously the issue here. I, I, I don't have that debate. Uh, but it is a debate no, no, you have to have. Yeah, because no, let, you, me, you, let, me, let me explain. I'll use right. examples. Please. When the Westerners conquered Japan, they realized that this war mentality resided in the main among the landed classes of Japan, the people who owned the land. So those were the upper classes. Yes. Who can then railroad society in a particular direction. So one of the things that was done, which then proved throughout Asia to be a major source of rapid economic progress, because it was repeated in different formats mm. across Asia, mm. but it was decisive. In, and in, continues today. And continues today. Is that land must be redistributed equally. Now to me that is an equality of outcome, because we're going to end up owning physically the same amount of land, right? But the aim of it is that we must be equal citizens. Yes. So you must not have instruments that give you the power to sway the nation and other people to be silenced and unable to debate in the nation. You go to nations like Sweden, and it is interesting that at, uh, in their social democracy, they say that there must be full employment, right? In other words, if everybody is economically independent, physically I have my money, I don't need to, to, to borrow things or to depend on you, I depend on myself, it's a society that is relatively equal. Then you find that then the lower classes, if you want to call them that, the working classes, tend to be more influential in the democracy under conditions of full employment, right? So we cannot say we're equal when our pockets are, not, when our pockets are empty. We, we cannot have to say, no, guys, we have equality of opportunity, but the other guy has got no soup and has got nothing to eat. Uh, it can't be. Uh, uh, you can't even think when you are actually f financially frustrated. So this idea of creating a false dichotomy of equality of opportunity and equality of outcomes is not there. We want to be able to say uh, a citizen, any citizen, 
does not have any reason to fear, and there are no physical impediments to them standing up to another citizen who's trying to derail the country or do any other thing. So that, I did that big debate about equality of opportunity, equality of outcome. For instance, in Finland, you don't have to look for a school because the schools are basically the same quality anywhere. So any school within walking distance of your, of your house will actually produce the same effect as the one that's 100, 100 kilometers away. So you don't need to look for a Michael house when we're in, sure. fin in Finland. Yeah. So to me, it is mischievous, right? And I don't believe in any form of poverty. And mm. I teach that to my children. Mm. I don't want any type of pov pov uh, amongst my family. I don't want poverty. I want people who are financially strong, who can stand up for themselves, who are intellectually strong, et cetera, et cetera. And I would like to have neighbors who are strong uh, as well, all around, regardless of their complexion. Now, you know, I, the, I've raised that point exactly, saying who doesn't want that? Who, you know, in this argument, who doesn't want that? Everybody wants everybody to be strong. They, you know, we would love to have, instead of a... a top end of our of our society of five to eight percent consumers any businessman would want 50 60 80 percent consumers we i mean i don't see that person that says we're benefiting out of this arrangement i don't think anybody is benefiting out of this arrangement we just need better instruments to get there but let's first discuss a couple of things if and i agree with with so much of what you said right let's start off with owning property if and we all know that our strength our base in life is is the home you own why will our government not give title deeds to rdp house owner house dwellers do you have any idea why they won't put give they're there anyway why will they not give them a, ta a title deed i think that uh, you know if you appoint criminals to run the state uh, and then you expect the, the, the criminals to fulfill the constitutional duties of the state, you are actually becoming ridiculous. I was asked as a consultancy to review the weaknesses in the IT system that runs these queues for housing. And I looked at it, and the only thing I can tell you that is a problem with the housing is crime. Crime by the people who are working for the state, who are representing the state. I don't care whether they are civil servants, whether those people are politicians. The, the crime and corruption that goes on in the process of housing is actually the problem. So now to expect noble outcomes from a criminal is ridiculous. Similarly, on the land question, because you have the housing question and you have also the land question, our land uh, program has not gone anywhere. Mm. We have friends, most of us. A chap says, Sunday, I owned a piece of land next to the Val River. Well, I thought it was probably worth 1.5 million, but the comrades came and bought it for 28 million. What was I supposed to do? But I took it and now I'm retired. Uh, because that money, the, the profit on the, if the land is worth 1.5, the other balance of that money, that uh, a, a, a balance, it's shared and, and, and distributed among certain interested parties. It's just crime and corruption. So you can't even say there was something wrong with the law. Dikhang Musineke and Advo, uh, Dikhang Musineke, uh, uh, former Deputy Chief Justice Dikhang Musineke, and the current senior counsel, Ngukai Tobi, both of them have said there is nothing in law that has presented, prevented the ANC from actually redistributing land yeah. fairly yeah, among sure. South Africans. There's nothing in law, in, in the existing law. Sure. So even the so-called uh, amendment to, to the, the Section 25, which caused a lot of, I mean, a lot of people were arguing irrelevant uh, points there. Sure. Because the, the thing that was relevant was that this amendment is not going to achieve anything that we cannot achieve already. It was useless, it was hype, it was meant to excite people who are ignorant, especially white landowners, mm. uh, who also started now to racialize the issue and to 
offer irrelevant arguments. They go to Tikhang Musineke and listen to what he's got to say about this on Nugai Tobi. You know, the temperatures would have been totally different. Sure. It's hard not to obviously have your cage rattled by people that are, that are saying those kind of things. You know, um, Let's look forward here. We've, we've outlined so many of the problems and you know, you know, some of the issues that bedevil us. But there's a price to pay ultimately. So we've paid the price for the ANC doing what they've done. And that is a country with 50% unemployment, with uh, rolling blackouts, which has crippled industry, uh, with uh, a, a sort of a um, crime cluster policing uh, prisons, which is an absolute mess. At what point does this start hurting the ANC at the polls? What happens in 2024, Sandini Swana? Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, all of us know this. Uh, it's yes. not a secret, and I'm sure you know, you know already yes. that when we look at statistics, which is what we must look at, from the IEC, after the Pulukwane Conference of the African National Congress, in every election, the ANC scored less votes in favor of the ANC. So they started losing votes. Uh, obviously, uh, for whatever reason, there are emotional attachments to the ANC, which is why I think the, uh, the decline in votes has been slow, but it has been decisive, decisively downward. Two senior officials of the ANC, Binkwede Mandashe, uh, who is the chairman of the African National Congress, said that they are now sitting at around 40% in their prediction for 2024. So the ANC does not expect to get a majority in 2024, in, 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 in call it 18 months or less uh, 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 from now. They are not going to get it. Zizi Kodwa made a worse statement in Cape Town when he said, he's a, he's a cabinet minister, he said, look, we can lose even six provinces as the ANC in South Africa, that will have to go into coalition. So where we are now, the skill, political skill that is needed by everybody who's involved in actual politics is the skill of form forming a winning coalition, a winning coalition, not just a coalition. The skill of saying what I myself in my own party, how do I become fit for purpose? to be attractive, to be part of an A-team uh, coalition. So that is the challenge now in the next remaining 14 months or so. To say, I don't think they should do it in 2024, by the way. I don't think they should do it after the election. That will be a mess. Yeah, yeah, that, that will be a mess. Uh, the ANC knows because, the, I mean, I, I have been answered by comrades, you know, uh, when I've said, why are these things not being negotiated before elections? They said, no, we want to negotiate on the basis of election results. Mm. And that has proved to be a mistake, yeah. right? So uh, now anybody, whether you are in the DA, and the DA I think has learned its lessons, that actually you can't come there as the absolute, total, absolute professor of coalitions that you know better than everybody. You are going to be kicked out. So... Now, all the issues that are relevant to coalitions, whether you are the PA, Gaten McKenzie, whether you are Malema, whether you are the Freedom Front Plus, whether you are the IFP, you need to engage your own people, you need to engage with other parties about what needs to go into these coalitions. And, and everybody needs to admit that nobody now, I think maybe for 20 years, is going to win a majority. So if one does uh, the numbers and if you do uh, the, the, the sort of analysis that you and I do regularly, um, it's not that difficult to see that you've got uh, the ANC, you've got uh, quite a few ANC proxy parties, Correct. right? Uh, the proxy parties are the EFF, the National Freedom Party down in KZN, uh, good Party uh, ATM. ATM, of course, is uh, is uh, the proxy party. So you've got these proxy parties, and it looks like by all the analysis, those parties are going to get somewhere north of fifty percent, probably around the fifty-five, even maybe up to fifty-eight percent. 
The other parties, which are represented by the DA, uh, Action SA, IFP, etc., they will get the balance. Do you see that changing in any way, or do you see? Uh, I, I I think there have been surprises, uh, maybe negative surprises. Mm. Uh, um, I thought there was an understanding, first of all, among the opposition parties, including the DA and EFF. Uh, the PA is also part of this little squabble here, but those two, DA and EFF, that the period we're in now is only about removing the ANC from power. In other words, the other parties need to support a view that says, let's keep the ANC out. It's not to say that it's based on hating the ANC. It's based on accepting that the ANC is run by criminals as a, cr a continuing criminal enterprise. And it needs to be kept out of power because the fuel that keeps the criminals attracted to the ANC is the money that you can extract yeah. from the state when you are in power. Yeah. So the politics, proper politics, uh, I heard you in one of your videos quoting one of my favorite politicians, Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, by the way, one of his most distinguishing features was to eliminate from power criminal politicians, gangster politicians, sure. and from the banking system to say they must, the banking system at the center must be controlled by the people, yeah. not by one man, yeah. uh, and, uh, uh, you know. Uh, Morgan in those days and so on. So, so, so all of those things need to be fixed where people go back to politics. In the UDF, in the Black Consciousness Movement, Azapo, PAC, we were in politics, pure politics. Now, uh, the politics are now 90% money and then 10% is something you cannot define. Do you think it's helpful to even think back to those days? And I, I, and I, I really sort of put that honestly, because if the country is going to progress, we need to understand that, you know, a struggle much like a war. Let, let's use the example of Ukraine. If you're a Ukrainian right now, we are all Ukrainians. Our mission becomes very simple, right? Our mission is to stop those guys from taking over our country, so let's fight. And then I don't care what your religious ideas are or what your view is on homosexuality or what music you like. I don't care. You're a Ukrainian, I'm a Ukrainian, we got a gun, you got a gun, we fight. Okay. Your mission is remarkably simple. And I'm saying that in the struggle, the mission was remarkably simple. Get rid of apartheid by almost any means necessary. That's simple. It united everybody. It, you know, I'm saying that is not a complex mission maybe to execute to complexity, but your mission, it, no one is going to disagree with the mission. Running a country is a completely different, completely different kettle of fish. Running a country needs that guy who wasn't at the front of the, of the brigade. He's probably some guy in the back working on his laptop who should be a, a functionary. Are we not continually fighting the wrong battle here by looking at a time that demanded different skills and putting too high a value on that. Whereas, you know, managing a business is a very boring affair, right? You've got to make more money than what you spend and you've got to make sure that this is right and that's right. It's not the glamour stuff. And politics, we want to be in the situation surely like those Scandinavian countries, for example, or even the Asian countries where you don't have celebrities as your politicians but they don't have blue lights they live amongst you you don't even know who the hell this minister is or that one are we not continuing to conflate the issues trying to get activists when we don't need activists i mean obviously julius malema in his performative politics he's trying to recreate the 70s but th we no longer live in the 70s there there is something that uh, sometimes is confused altogether uh, for instance, uh, I lived in Soweto. One of the uh, celebrated activists, black consciousness activists in Soweto, was a fellow called uh, uh, Asfad, Abu Baga, Dr. Abu Baga Asfad in Rockville, Soweto. And he had his practice there. He had his yeah. practice there. So now bear in mind that this man is not exercising theoretical medicine. Mm -hmm. He is actually touching us as his patients and healing people. 
and he's an anti-apartheid activist and he's spreading uh, healing with other doctors in partnership. So the struggle was not always run by people who were unskilled, who, were, who didn't have something concrete to deliver to the community. Sure. In education, there were superior educationists who were involved in making sure that the maths classes continue, but they actually knew mathematics, and so on and so forth. Tambo was an actual lawyer, an actual professional, before he became the activist that he became. So these were people who were productively engaged in life. Now, the lot that has come in into cabinet today, and a lot of the people who are in parliament in, and, and in municipal councils, regardless of which time period we are talking about, these are people who should not be there in the first place under any conditions or circumstances. 70s or 80s or 90s or 2000, they should not be there because they have no track record of productivity in anything. So that's one element to consider. The second element to consider is that the, for instance, a person like me, why did I ever choose to involve myself in the struggle? What the hell did I choose that? I realized one simple thing, that if apartheid continues, my talents, which I thought I had in the 1970s, late 70s, between 76 and 79, I made this decision as a boy, that if this government remains in power, regardless of how much talent I think I have, it will never be realized in South Africa. But when you realize your talent, then it speaks to the type of food you eat. It speaks to the type of house you live in. It speaks to the type of car you have. It's the type of neighborhood you live in. So the struggle to me in the 70s and today was about the quality of life. It was about the standard of living. I was not fighting the Boers and the apartheid for any other thing other than my quality of life and my standard of living. That cause remains today. I'm not here even talking here today uh, because for any other reason other than to say, guys, by now my standard of living should have been 10 times better. By now the standard of living of my children should have been 100 times better. My neighbors, the people I grew with, should have long been accumulating large pensions for themselves rather than phoning me and asking me for money. So the struggle is not vague. And the ANC wrote this to say, guys, in the, through the eye of the nickel and, 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 and the document that says the new cater, it says in every epoch, you need caters who are suitable for that phase of struggle. But the essence of the struggle, even when you read up the Freedom Charter itself, the Freedom Charter is talking about quality of life. And this is where the ANC has failed deliberately because even these monies that they've stolen, it's just a random accumulation of excessive wealth that is taking nobody anywhere. There's just nothing. Nothing, absolutely nothing. There's no philosophies. There's no art that comes from ANC cadres. There's no music that comes out of them. Because when you are a leader of society, we see the flourishing of the arts. When there's leadership in society, when you see the artists flourishing, whether it's sculptures, paintings, music, then you know there's leadership in the country. Once the art starts collapsing, then you know that you are in darkness. You've entered the dark ages. The light inside the head of every South African is going off because there is no light at the top. Well, let's hope that that light comes back and let's hope we get to be entertained. We're going to be discussing a lot more of this in the build-up to, uh, to next year's general election. Sandile, it's been wonderful having this conversation with you. Uh, to everybody that's joined us today, thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. If you have, please Subscribe to our State of the Nation channel and we will see you with another great interview soon. Thank you so much for joining us today.